Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Lots of questions and lots of answers is what we have planned for today. It's a Q&A show just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. We love viewer questions. Unfortunately, we can't put all the answers on TV because there's just not enough time. We have never done a Q&A show in the spring, so we have lots of questions from the past few years to choose from. Where to start? How about a question about starting a vegetable garden? What should you consider before starting a vegetable garden? Which is a good question. Mr. Tom, you're a vegetable guru. What do you think about that? It's well, it's kind of like they say about real estate. <laughs> okay. Location, location, right. location. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, uh, you want some place that gets a minimum of uh, six hours of light, okay. say daylight, uh, close to a water source, and also the, the condition of the, the ground, mm -hmm. what to do it. But uh, it doesn't really matter all that much. The fact is, if you get in there and garden and start growing your own vegetables, you can always adjust and correct later on in the season. But like I said, basically, is you got to have a, a, a at least six hours of daylight. Okay. And also taking consideration trees. Okay. That uh, for shading purposes. Okay. That uh, may actually it's kind of neat to have trees on the west side of a garden because when you get in the heat of the day they start getting shaded and kind of helps keep the uh, garden cool. Okay. So that's what I shoot for. Okay. Location, <clears throat> location, location. Yeah, you're exactly <laughs> right. Anything to add to that, Mr. Joe? I always like to, to make sure that I have a high percentage of organic matter, if uh, possible, in the uh, soil. You know, it just seems to help my garden tremendously to, to something to yeah. kind of hold a little moisture during those dry periods and give it a little bit of drainage right. when, you know, when it's overly wet. So. Yeah, I was understand that it's like uh, ideal organic percentage is around 15%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, organic matter is important. You know, I just covered mine up with leaves this yeah. this, this mm -hmm. time. I'm gonna have to check the pH, but you know, I, I try to cover it up with leaves and then work them into the soil in the spring. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, those trees are great. I, I know uh, <laughs> I, I know my garden's a little bit too close. I'm getting some root invasion, so I guess uh, people need to yeah. kind of watch that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, because they don't want anything competing with it. But okay. mm -hmm. right. they can always build the raised beds too, can't they? Uh, yeah, you can get it on the ground. But the roots right. will find those too. They will. They will. Won't they? Yeah, All they right. sure will. Mm -hmm. Last year, squash bugs drove me crazy. What can I do to stay ahead of them this growing season? And this is from Mary. So we'll start with you. That's honey. my most hated <laughs> garden I insect. Knew you liked that. I hate those things. <laughs> I would say, uh, first off, scout early for uh -huh. the eggs. Okay. <laughs> They're going to be in nice, neat little rows, yes, kind of, kind of nice little diagonal rows, and they're going to be kind of a bronzy color. Uh -huh. And get rid of those things as, <laughs> just, as soon as you see them. If you do have to spray them, um, spray the nymphs. The trick is to get out there early, early. before mm -hmm. they start reproducing like crazy. And I have heard that for one method, you can lay boards down in your garden or newspaper mm -hmm. down, and at night they will go underneath those boards or newspapers, and if you get out there early in the morning, you can pick them all up and take them out. Heard that. Um, now, if you do have to spray, you need to spray a product like a permethrin or something like that. Um, our insecticidal soaps, once they get to be adults, it, it's not very effective at all. Does not work. No. No. Mr. D, what do you think? Uh, permeth <laughs> permethrin <laughs> yep, is, permethrin. is a good product. Uh -huh. uh, also, there, there are a couple other synthetic okay. pyrethroids out of the Red Book. Uh, uh, bifenthrin and zeta cypermethrin and esphenvalerate in addition to permethrin mm -hmm. will also work. Uh, but again, as you mentioned on the small ones, uh, it's, uh, they're a lot easier to kill. You didn't mention the organic method of using two bricks. Oh, <laughs> gosh. <laughs> yeah, move your like thumbs. That, that, that will work too. I have resorted to buying yellow squash at the grocery store or the farmer's markets just because I hate those squash bugs so much they, and they are hard to control. They are tough, Miss Mary. And, yes. Uh, as you can see, Tanya hates them as well. 
uh, on, but, the, on the insecticides, uh, you do need to follow the label. Sure. Yeah, I was and I say. noticed uh, some of them, it says wait at least seven days yeah. between applications. And some of them you can't apply more than eight times during the season. Well, but in some cases, you will need all eight of them. Yes. Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> exactly right. So those things are tough. <laughs> Are grass and weed seeds able to germinate immediately or do they have to be exposed to sunlight for a while? And this is from Jim. So he wants to know about grass and weed seeds. <laughs> well, you know, different seeds have different germination requirements, mm -hmm. uh, different days to germinate. As far as grass, it can take a Bermuda grass seed up to two weeks to, mm -hmm. to fully germinate. So it just depends on what seed you've turned up as far as your weeds and everything. Right, and I can tell you something else too about those weed seeds now. Sunlight is what they need. Also moisture, nutrients, space, and air. Mm -hmm. You give it all of that, they're gonna germinate pretty good. Yeah. Right. They're gonna outcompete <laughs> your grasses and whatever else you have there as well. But you're right about those Bermuda seeds. It's gonna take a couple of weeks, you know, for those to get, uh, if those start growing. As long as they get good soil contact, mm -hmm. get that moisture that they need, they're gonna sprout up. Is this a good time to get your soul tested? And this is from Jim. So what do you think about that? Yes. Yes, <laughs> it is. Actually, any time. Right. <laughs> the only thing you have to be concerned about is if your soil pH is really low and you want to raise it by the addition of lime, mm -hmm. it is not an overnight process. It takes about five, six months for the lime to actually start affecting the pH. Okay. So if you're planting a, a, a spring garden, It'd be a good time uh, in the fall to have your soil tested. Uh, of course, if you want to do it multiple times a year, that's fine. Now, one of the things, though, about it is they do not test for nitrogen. Right. This and the true. reason being is nitrogen's natural state is gas. So when you put nitrogen in the soil, eventually it wants to go home, goes back into the sky. <laughs> so it's very migratory. Mm -hmm. Whereas a phosphorus, potassium, or minerals, they have the tendency to stay in the soil. Right. You know, they, they're there for quite a while. Okay. But yeah, this is a good time to get your soil tested, Mr. Jim. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do that anytime. This is a good time. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually got my soil tested uh, maybe a month or so ago, so do it. <laughs> it is something that we advise folks to do because mm -hmm. pH is very important. Absolutely. Very important. Should I fertilize my shrubs? in the spring. So what do you think about that, our horticulturist? Well, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You, want to, you want to fertilize okay. in the spring. Now, timing varies on some, um, particularly things like azaleas. We tell people to fertilize after they bloom, and so the blooming time can be very wide. The only reason is the flower bud is set at the very end of last year's mm -hmm. growth, and if you fertilize early and force that growth out, you cover your bloom. Okay. So we don't fertilize azaleas till after they bloom, and then usually again around the first of June. Most perennials I like to feed every 60 days or so up until about July or so. Okay. Um, lawns, once a month, mm -hmm. you know, they're heavy feeders. Roses are heavy feeders. Right. I want to fertilize those once a month. What are you so fertilizing yes. your shrubs with? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tell you. Okay. I use an all-purpose, a 12-6-6 formulation. Mm -hmm. You know, when you walk into a store and you see fertilizer, it says rose food, 6-10-10, 12-8-4, all these different numbers, and they're specifically for roses. Well, I, there's no way they can tell you exactly what right. you need because they don't know your soil. Right. What they're doing is getting you to fertilize, and that's the most important thing, is getting some food down on that plant and getting it growing, and that makes you happy, okay? So you'll see the results that you want, mm -hmm. whether or not it might be exactly the right nutrients. Who knows? But it works. It works. Yeah. Mr. D, anything to add to that? The <laughs> only works. thing I would, I would again, I'd go back to soil test. Okay. You know, soil test is the Very only way important. that you, you can be sure. And when you go with the routine fertilizer like that, you need to keep in mind that phosphorus is much more stable than any of the other elements. Mm -hmm. And if you continue to put that, that third number, that, that phosphorus out there, two or three years in a row, then it is very likely that your, your phosphorus levels will get to excessively high levels. And if you have excessively high levels of phosphorus, it can interfere with the uptake of your other nutrients. So uh, potassium, on the other hand, is not, 
it doesn't stay there that long. It will leach out over a period of three or four months. Mm -hmm. Nitrogen, four to six weeks, yeah, uh, unless it's sulfur coated or, or you know, a uh, slow release type. Right. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind that the phosphorus is very, very stable and it can tend to accumulate over time. And that's why you do need to check that soil every once in a while. And if that's the case, then you're gonna to need to go with something that's gonna be, you know, like six, Right. Six zero, yeah, or you know, you go with something that doesn't have any phosphorus for two or three that, years. You know, where you were talking about the pH that like a pH up around six, six and a half. Azaleas, hollies, dogwoods like pH five and a half and right. down. Blueberries right. five to four and a half. Right. So right. you want to make sure that you're fertilizing with the right thing. You don't want to bring the boxwood fertil bring your <laughs> pH down in your boxwoods right. or right. raise it in the other one. So right. Right. you know, a good classic example are hydrangeas. Mm -hmm. You know. Put a little, make them acidic, they turn blue. Make them alkaline, they turn pink. And it yeah. takes just a little bit of stuff to make that swing. So you can Good see point. how important it is oh, yeah. to check that pH. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. We really like getting viewer questions from you. This week, we are showing you some of the spring questions from the past few years we did not get to air because of time. We do answer them all and post the answers at familyplotgarden.com. We also collect them for shows like this. Up next, ladybugs in the house. What's the best way to get rid of ladybugs in the home? I don't want to spray them if I don't have to. So Walter, what do you think about that? So, cause they're gonna come in the home, but yes. they don't want to spray, which you shouldn't, right? You shouldn't have to spray. You, 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 you shouldn't have to spray, and I can just tell you what I do. Okay. Uh, I actually have a little shop vac, uh -huh. and I actually <laughs> just vacuum them up, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> then I take them outside, and I just throw them out in there and let them keep going, cause they're beneficial. So they're beneficial. I just don't want to kill them. Yeah, I, I don't want to kill them at all. Uh, they are friends in the garden, without yes, a doubt. Without, yeah, I mean, they take care of a lot of problems for us. All right, Mr. Tom, anything to add to that? Well, I just pick them. I just take yeah. my cereal uh, fingers, that's what I that's... open the back door and go, ping, yeah. and they'll, they'll land on their feet. And like <laughs> Walter said, they are a beneficial, beneficial plant, especially been plagued with aphids, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's their natural food. Right. So just tolerate them. Yeah, the ladybugs, you know, of course, in the wintertime, they like us. They, yes. they want to go where it's warm. Yes, and right. they are attracted to white. Uh-huh. So mm -hmm. you always find them in Window the rooms seal. that are yeah. white. But if they just had, if they just didn't want them in there at all, probably some type of permethrin type product at the base of the entry points or whatever, I right. guess. Will yeah, but yeah, them. if you just want to seal up cracks and crevices, I right. mean, that could be something you could do as well. Mm -hmm. But again, they are friends in the garden. Is it too late to use a dormant spray on my shrubs? What do you think about that, Mr. D? Actually, you just got to do talking about it a little this bit. Is, this is fine. Almost everything I look at is February, March. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything yeah. I know of is yeah, February, March. You know, so for the so most it's, not, it's not too late. Uh, you need to get it done by the end of the month if you can. Uh, and and I, my friend at the National Weather Service said <laughs> that we're not going to have any hard freezes, any more hard freezes, so that would be the only thing I would worry about. Yeah. You don't want to put an oil spray out there. Uh, when a hard freeze will come in before the water evaporates from that oil spray, because that can create you some problems. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we've got to worry about that now. This well, spring. thank you, your friend, because now I'm going to put out the rest of my property. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, but you know, the dormant sprays, Mr. D, I always tell people are underutilized. Mm -hmm. They are. You know, I, I think if you start those early enough in the season, it, it's, it's the first step to me in the means of controlling a lot of your scales and your aphids and some of your other pests. To me, it's a start. It's right. a good start. You might just nip a problem in the bud. Yeah. I think it's a real good start to use those dormant sprays. And make sure you read the label on that too, because it's going to tell you, uh, you know, when the best time it is to use that product. You know, on the label, it's usually 40, between 40 to about 80 degrees I've seen, mm -hmm. you know, on some of those products. And uh, it'll tell you how to mix it and all that good exactly. stuff too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, make sure you read the label on that product. 
I saw landscapers power washing crepe myrtle trees last summer to remove scale. Is this a good way to treat crepe myrtle scale? Does it do any harm to the plants? And this is from Tom and Bartlett. So they're out there power washing the crepe myrtles to knock off the crepe myrtle bark scale, uh, which is a recommendation. What do you think about that? Will it harm the tree? That depends on the power washer. That depends you've on the got. power washer. You know, if yeah. you're just washing it off, scrubbing it off, right. and it's not tearing into the bark of the plant, you're, it's, it's probably a good thing. Right. But I've seen power washers that could could, could just about eat concrete. And, <laughs> and, uh, if it's stripping the bark, right. if it's da damage to the bark, then don't do it. Right. It depends on your power washer. Okay. Probably most power and, and how close you are, yeah, how, how, how you, you handle are, your power yeah. washer. Okay. And the spray but, itself, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're doing like a pinpoint spray, I mean, you can knock off some bark. You can prune with it. Yes, <laughs> right. Pinpoint. My, yeah, my goodness. Power. But you know, uh, Dr. Frank Hale, and you know Dr. Hale, mm -hmm. uh, our etymologist uh, for extension, talks about using an angled 15% fan spray. Okay, mm -hmm. and he said that will actually do some good. Angled 15% fan spray would actually do so some good. So that's why you're not pointing directly. Yeah, you're not pointing you yeah, directly at it. Down. Right. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. If pinpoint yeah. spray or something like that, especially close, yeah, wouldn't. <laughs> Man, you'll blow bark off the tree. I mean, you know, my ATV, the four-wheeler, they don't recommend <laughs> washing with a power washer because it'll take the paint off. Wow. Okay. So, you know. So there you have it, right? <laughs> I mean, I just, it, depends on your, it depends on your power washer. If I have fire blight on my pear tree last year, would it return this year? What can I do to prevent it? So, Mr. D, they have fire blight last year on their pear trees, will they have it this year? Depends. Depends. If there is, if we have a wet spring, possibly. Possibly. Likely, very likely okay. if we have a wet spring. And my friend at the National Weather, Weather Service said we're probably <laughs> gonna have a wet spring because of the El Nino effect. Oh and, man. Well, uh, for this weekend, I measured at my house eight and a half inches. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty so, wet, huh? Yeah, we, we, so far my, it's kind of unusual. My ma my friend at the National Weather Service has been right. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, so I would I would say very likely. And if you want to, if you see that happening, and you and you, and you look at the forecast, and they're calling for continued rain and all that, uh, there's a couple of applications that you can make. A delayed dormant <laughs> sp spray when the buds are beginning to swell, mm -hmm. which is probably pretty close to now. Yeah. Uh, you, pr you can go with uh, an oil emulsion plus copper, <coughs> and uh, that uh, you definitely want to use uh, the copper if you had a history of fire blight. Uh, so you would want to do that pretty quickly. And then at early bloom, uh, several applications of streptomycin, Agristrep 17, or, or you know one of those at three to five day intervals would, would give you some relief. Okay. But uh, wow, use only if necessary. That's in big capital letters here Only in, the, in the small in, in wow. the, in the uh, UT guide here. The leaves of my holly shrubs are orange in color. Do I need to be concerned, Miss Susie? Should well, I be concerned about that? Um, not overly concerned. Okay. First, you need to determine: is it really a holly or uh, is it a boxwood? Yeah, yeah. And the difference is the arrangement on the mm -hmm. stem. The holly is. Um, alternate mm -hmm. the boxwood is opposite and their placement okay um good, and both good. are great plants and both of them are susceptible to what's called winter burn mm -hmm. so um they recover from it quickly once spring gets here but over the winter they're a little bit overexposed and they get sunburned and mine go through that every year so, so do I. don't worry about it and they'll put out new growth and it'll be fine yeah i don't, I don't even worry about grabbing the pruners i just no. wait it greens up yeah. it does Walter, anything to add to that no yeah I'll Pretty much have that one covered, uh, you know. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, we definitely want folks to know the difference between the two, though. Mm -hmm. And I always think box opposite, box mm -hmm. ox is what I go. You know, opposite leaf arrangement. I need to remember that. Yeah. That's how I remember that. Yeah, but it should be fine. So don't worry about that orange color. And it's pretty much, you know, we see it, especially when we have, you know, brutal winters, which yeah. we actually had this past mm -hmm. winter, I think. Yeah. You it's know, for the most part. Why is moss growing on my lawn? And this is from Joe, mm -hmm. okay? Why do you think the moss is there? Well, actually, it's probably very poor soil. Uh-huh, again, we're talking and about soil, soil fertility. Indeed. Right. And the pH, uh -huh. 
and uh, the fact that it uh, uh, it's probably open dirt because it's not fertile. Mm -hmm. There's probably very little or thin grass in that area. Right. Gives moss a chance to make, and probably some shade. Right. Because moss grows in the shade. Right. It grows in the shade, loves the shade. Something else that comes to mind is compaction. Yep, compaction. Yeah. Compaction mm -hmm. is a problem, and you might have poor drainage. That's also true. Right. So either you encourage the moss to grow, you know, and take mm -hmm. over the rest of the yard, or you do the cultural practices to get rid of the moss. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some things that you can go out there to spray if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those, of course, would contain the active ingredient iron sulfate, mm -hmm. you know, you can use. Um, but I always like to go to the cultural practices first before mm -hmm. you actually start spraying stuff. Right. All right. I agree. All right. So once you do that, Mr. Joe, you'll be fine. You get rid of that moss. Although, a lot of people like moss. I've seen a lot of moss in a lot of yards these days. Mm -hmm. If you keep the leaves off of it, it grows just fine. Mm -hmm. It looks real good. It looks neat, and you don't have to cut it. This is true. This <laughs> you is don't have true. to cut it. Matter of fact, around my flagstones, the little area between them, uh -huh. the, fly, uh, the moss growing between the flagstones adds to the beauty huh. of the flagstones. So you let it stay. It yeah. looks good. What are your views for using paint to seal pruning wounds? And this is from Mr. Mike. All right. Mike, mm -hmm. I think it's a terrible waste of paint. <laughs> you know, uh, research has shown that if you put any kind of wound dressing on a, a pruning cut or, or a tree that's injured, that you're actually doing more harm than good because you're putting a barrier that actually keeps that wound from drying out and mm. And uh, you know we learned that in the pecan industry with limbs that were broken off pecan trees down on the Gulf Coast after the storms that we had. Okay. We tried to paint those broken off limbs and, and wounds with a, a, a pruning sealant and you had a lot more trouble with the ones. I mean, it would just continue to eat on into the tree and wow. get worse and worse and worse. But a tree has a, a, can put a natural barrier between damaged tissue and, and healthy tissue mm -hmm. and it's good at doing that and it'll heal up and, it, and you, if you, you notice when you make printing cuts how if you leave about a quarter of an inch uh, of a limb, it'll be a nice little scar there and, yeah. it'll, it, and it'll heal up really good. And um, so, this may, no, you know, no. I don't like, I don't, I don't do any sealants <laughs> or on, on my printing cuts and I do a lot of pruning. And I know you do a lot of pruning. <laughs> so let it seal naturally. That's right. Okay. So that's what the, the white paint, that's what I used to see back in the country, you know, um, back in the day, I guess, on some of the trees, pecan and, trees, it looks like. Yeah, yeah, and no, no, that's like, totally different. That's not so, a so that's different. So it's not, no, okay, so that, What you're trying to do there is you're trying to reflect the sunlight. Right, okay. So if you I have you. young trees, uh, they will break dormancy uh, early in the spring when the sun shines in, south, especially the southwest sun late in the afternoon, okay. it will cause it to break dormancy. And if the temperature drops below freezing that night, that freezing and thawing will mess you up. So pecan trees, they will paint the trunks white okay. to reflect the sunlight, to yeah. keep that for reflection. Keep it, cool. keep it cool. Okay. Reflection. Okay. But mm. no paint for sealing. No, not the pruning cuts. The leaves of my azaleas have lost their green color. I've heard that a lot. What could be causing that? And we're thinking it could be a couple of things. Yes, you know, I, I typically think of uh, nitrogen deficiency mm -hmm. and also think of iron deficiency, but it could be a lot of problems. It could be a drainage issue it if be. it's in a bad spot, you know, that that, that could be a problem. It, it could be, and I'm thinking too, uh, azalea lace bugs, you know, yes. something that I see uh, all the time throughout the landscape here in Shelby County. Uh, if you flip those leaves over again, okay, <laughs> uh, you will see those azalea lace bugs. They have the lace-looking wings. Yeah. Got it, lace bugs. Um, they have pierce-sucking mouth parts. It's almost like a needle, like an epidermic needle. Ooh. It is actually sucking plant juice again, uh, plant sap from the underside of that leaf, mm -hmm. and it, the leaf looks discolored. Yes. Okay? And what happens? It actually drops off prematurely. Right. But you can tell that they've been there because you see the black, shiny insect waste, which yes. is its excrement. And you can also see the cast off uh, skin. When it molted, it actually okay. leaves the skin behind. You can actually see that with the eye. So that's, that's what I'm, it could be that, yes. it, it could be. You know, Phil DeRushing once said this, beware of plants that are named after bugs. 
<laughs> Azalea, Azalea Lace Buzz. He, always, he said that. I remember that. Um, but look, if, if it is a nutrient deficiency, you know, you can do the soil test, you know, right. uh, get your line built up, what have you. If it, uh, if it is the Lace Buzz, look, it's a couple of different things here. Again, you can use the systemic soil dredges in the spring, or if you catch them early enough, you can use insecticidal soap. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is a lot safer, but you have to catch them pretty early. Yeah. Right. Because they're a couple of generations a year. And it seems like the hotter it gets, they and start to multiply. Yes. They get very active. And, and, and you know, the uh, systemic may be a good approach with the Amatoclopid because yeah. a lot of those products, it's like a 9 to 12 month. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's a year worth of control. Yeah, worth of control. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of depends on your situation. Right, right. You know, I like to let the homeowners make their own right, choice, right. but. Yeah, you get a year's worth of control if right. you go with the... And then you catch both generations. Right. You yeah. catch the multiple generations, so there you have it. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. To get more information on the questions we answered this week, go to familyplotgarden.com. We have all of today's questions listed at the top of the homepage. Thanks for watching and thanks for sending in the questions. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.